and welcome to this month's edition of Hocus Focus. I'm Sarah Mondaini. And I'm Thomas Sheridan. And as ever, thank you for joining us for another episode. And thank you so much for your response last week to the new look of the show. And of course, for your patience. And time-wise, doing this for a two-hour show every week would be nigh on impossible for me. So we hope that the new monthly schedule means that you'll look forward to and savour us even more. And in this month's episode, there are a few extra ghostly characters and new things that will drift in and out amongst the bats in the house tonight. So if you're in the live chat when this goes out, let us know when you spot the extras throughout the show. And we have another 40 in jam-packed episode for you this month, which includes our two chosen topics, all your regular favourites. So make sure you stick around so you don't miss a thing. And Thomas, it's been a long, cold winter and we are heading into March. Spring is finally springing. And so, how have you been since I last saw you? Yeah, it does feel like spring. Uh, there's, it's been rent feeling overload. But I'll talk about that in the weather. But uh, yeah, it's good to see the daffodils starting to shoot up and uh, that kind of thing. I've noticed the buds on the willow trees and on that and on the the other the other early flowering trees. So yeah, it's it's been it's been cold. It's not cold at all now. It's actually quite mild. I don't know how it is where you are, but it's the last few days haven't been too bad. And I have to say, I th I thought last week showed up fantastic. I didn't want to see it until you broadcast it. And I loved all the bats and the whole gothic theme was brilliant. I liked what you said when you mentioned about it looked very Hammer House of Horror. I'm glad you said that because I was kind of going for that aesthetic. Somewhere between Hammer House of Horror and uh, Edgar Allan Poe. So I was happy that it got the seal of approval. Definitely had that feel. Well, without further ado, let's get started with the show and for our first topic tonight our focus is on a phenomenon that's intrigued many people myself and Thomas included and that is the subject of ghostly premonitions of death. Now these are experiences where individuals claim to receive forewarnings or intuitions about death from beyond the grave and these encounters often involve apparitions, dreams or other unexplained phenomena that precede the actual event. And the first documented ghostly premonition of death I want to talk about tonight is about the death knock and it's also referred to as the death visit or the angel of death. And it's a paranormal phenomenon where people report hearing three loud knocks on the door or an encounter with a ghostly figure or mysterious presence that is seen as an omen of death. Now, I've experienced this one myself and it was the night before my grandmother had died and I'd gone to bed and I was awoken in the night by three incredibly loud and very slow knocks at the front door and they were booming and they didn't sound of this world due to the strange echo. And I was living alone at the time and I didn't want to go down and open the door. So after a bit of deliberating, I opened the window and looked down and there was nothing there. So I told myself I must have been dreaming and I went back to bed. Anyway, at 9.30 the following morning, I was in work and I saw a voicemail from my mum asking me to call her immediately. And when I did, I was given the news that my grandmother had passed away at 9am that morning. So when I told my parents about the death knocks, my dad had told me that he had had the same knocks at their house too, but theirs had occurred on the window. And on another occasion, I'd woke up one night and saw the spirit of my other grandmother standing over me and she was stroking my face and hair. And I felt this immense amount of love and warmth just wash over me really. And so I turned back to sleep feeling as safe as when I was a child when she would put me to bed. And the following day, my cat was taken very poorly all of a sudden and out of the blue. And I had to make the decision to have him put to sleep. And it was the love and warmth that I felt at seeing my grandmother the previous night that got me through that horrible day. And then we also have a really strange phenomena that's known as phantom funerals. And they're also known as goblin or fairy funerals. Now, these are folkloric supernatural events that can only be seen by certain sensitive people. And it's like an apparition of the living and they can foreshadow a real funeral or a person still alive. Now, the witness to this spectral phenomenon recognises the participants at the funeral and sees details 
that are later observed at the real funeral. And these processions occur in the same place and will take the same route as the funeral that is being foretold. And they're sometimes known as goblin or fairy funerals because they're believed by some people to be sent by the fairies to unsettle humans. Now to add to this, there's also the sound of a ghostly coffin maker and many coffin makers over the years have said they've heard the sounds of hammering and sawing and all the other usual sounds in the process of making a coffin and this is called the tolath before the coffin and it's believed that the funeral ceremony is rehearsed by the soul of the person who is going to die and also by the souls of people affected or connected to the ceremony and the souls even practice with the wood to make the coffin, the coffin nails, and even the death clothes. In fact, anything else needed for the funeral. And these spiritual sounds of the coffin being made have been reported to be heard by the joiner who will make the actual coffin. And there's also people who report seeing the ghost of a living relative. And they look like the healthiest and best version of themselves. And they might appear and they might smile or wave and then disappear and then the following day the news that they've died comes and the apparition starts to make sense again this is something i've experienced with a friend who was very poorly in the hospice and i was lying in bed in the darkness one evening when he appeared over the bed and he looked right down at me and he looked really well and he looked very healthy and he was in blue checked pajamas and it took me by surprise because he just sprung over the bed like a jack-in-the-box in which case then I jumped out of bed and as he I jumped out of bed, he reversed out of the room and out through the window as though he was attached to a cord that had been pulled back. And the next day when I went to see him, he was wearing new pyjamas that were the same ones that he'd had on during his ghostly visit. And shortly after that, he passed away. Now, I also want to bring a few famous historical examples of people who've experienced ghostly premonitions. Abraham Lincoln, the 16th President of the United States, said he dreamed of his own assassination just days before the event at Ford's Theatre in 1865. And three days before his death, Lincoln recanted his dream in which he dreamt he could hear mournful sounds and he was searching through the White House to find where they were coming from. And he arrived at the East Room and inside there was a catafalque with a corpse wrapped in funeral clothing and there were guards stood all around it and a group of people were mourning the body and they were weeping. So Lincoln, in this dream, asked one of the guards who had died in the White House and the guard said it was the president who'd been killed by an assassin. In regards to the Titanic, many individuals cancelled the plans to sail on the ship due to ominous feelings or dreams that they shouldn't get on it. And months before 9-11, many people reported having dreams and feelings about an attack on the World Trade Center. And some people said they cancelled flights and took the day off work. And one man, Eamon James McKearney, was an employee at Cantor Fitzgerald on the 105th floor of the North Tower. And in the months leading up to 9-11, he'd had a series of premonitions about his own death. And he even talked about the possibility of a terrorist attack on the World Trade Center. And he and his brother talked about escape routes, should it ever happen. And then he started to lecture his wife about being a better disciplinarian of their children because he wasn't going to be around that long. And on the morning of September the 11th, he had an attack of vertigo, but he insisted on going to work and he never came home. The Aberfan disaster in Wales on October the 20th, 1966, had many reports of dreams prior to this happening that gave great detail. And there were so many of them that a London psychiatrist called J.C. Barker suggested it should be looked into further. And there was at least 36 premonition dreams of the disaster, and they were all fully documented and fully confirmed as being accurate. And 24 premonitions happened while awake. And because of the sheer magnitude of this finding, the British Premonitions Bureau was established in 1966, along with the New York Central Premonitions Registry. Now, while these dreams are not ghostly 
visitations or sounds. They are apparitions in the form of visions and so I brought them into the topic because they were mysterious and unnerving premonitions given what was to come. And there are many possible explanations to the phenomenon and a few that I consider possibilities are that of reincarnation. Now I believe that an individual's soul is reborn into a new body after death and before we incarnate we know at the soul level in our life between lives how our next incarnation will turn out so it could be possible that ghostly premonitions of death are a result of that knowledge from our soul life between physical lives seeping into our current consciousness and so a person may receive glimpses of events that were known before incarnating to experience them. And astral travel is another possibility. Our consciousness can leave the physical body and travel to other realms or dimensions. And so those who experience ghostly premonitions might be tapping into information or witnessing events while in this out of body state. And the information obtained could manifest as visions or premonitions back in the physical body, providing insight into future occurrences. And then there's a the nervous system. The nervous system processes information from our surroundings. And psychometry is the ability to touch objects that carry energy and information from the past and for us to be able to read them. And similarly, individuals might unconsciously pick up on subtle clues or energies associated with future events. And this heightened sensitivity could lead to premonitions where the nervous system acts as a conduit for information about an impending occurrence. And then we have the Schumann resonance, which is the natural frequency of the Earth's electromagnetic field. Another possibility there is some individuals can tap into this resonance and receive information about future events. Human consciousness is connected and influenced by the Earth's electromagnetic frequencies, so it could act as a conduit for premonitions, allowing certain people to sense or foresee significant events. And then, of course, Within paranormal experiences, many people believe, including myself, that spirits of loved ones who've passed away can communicate with the living. And some of these communications can include warnings about impending danger or death, whether that's via dreams, apparitions or intuitive feelings. These interactions are a form of guidance from the spirit world. Now, I believe it's more likely that it's all of those possibilities and each premonition delivery service is different and unique for each person who receives it. And that's my take on ghostly premonitions of death. Many people have experienced it. There are folklore, legend and stories passed down about it. And I don't think it's something that should be written off as an over overactive imagination. I think it's a very real phenomenon. And what are your thoughts on the subject, Thomas? Have you ever experienced anything like that? No, not me personally. Um, my mother told me that the night before her father died, they heard his footsteps walking down the stairs in the, to the landing where he was in bed as if he'd already left before he'd actually died, as if the, the, the spirit of him in terms of sound had departed the night before he died. I'll give you a few other ones. Uh, I'm very interested in the folkloric aspects of this. You named a few there yourself. In rural New England, in the mountains of places like Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, there's the story of the whippoorwill. The whippoorwill makes noise at night, and the closer somebody is to dying, the more frantic their noise becomes. And when the person dies, the pitch changes. And this legend is that the whippoorwill tries to get the soul of the person who just died and steal it for themselves. And if they catch the soul of the person before they've moved on to Bardo or reincarnation or heaven or whatever, they make a wild cackling sound. So the whippoorwill is a portent of impending death within rural communities of, uh, you know, the mountains and the forest of New England. There's also, we have, that's very similar to the Irish one of the Banshee. Uh, the Banshee story is that she cries outside the house of somebody who's about to die. And that's a that's a big deal that like and it was anyway, even my mother's generation. And if you found a comb 
that in the field or made no sense. It was the banshee who was combing her hair as she was wailing about to bring somebody from a family over to the other side. In Norway, there are stories of a stranger who knocks on the door, very similar to your three knocks thing, although the number of knocks isn't specified. But they knock on the door and they um, uh, they, they just stand there and then they leave. And then that's that's means that somebody in the house is going to die that night. It's all over the world. It's, it's, it's uh, There's all kinds of sounds, phantoms and spirits per- pertaining to these things. And they're very common in the military. And not surprising, soldiers have premonitions uh, based on all kinds of superstitions in all the military branches. Re- you know, the night before, this, oh, tomorrow I'm going to get it. That's what they would say, things like that. How do you know? Oh, there would be kind of um, jinxes and hex- jinxes and things that would go wrong. Like if you were uh, doing something and um, you you poured out milk and it was sour. This was one that was in, in Napoleonic times. And as sour went, the milk was sour. That meant that you would the next day you'd be killed in battle and this kind of thing. So it's a very common thing. And it's very, but what I find most interesting about it is how culturally specific it is. Each culture seems to have its own version of it. And uh, it's, you know, you, you know, the Abafan thing, that's a very powerful one. What I find about the Abafan one was that those children expressed that in art in painting and drawings. They didn't just, did just only tell their mother and father that the next day they were going to be crushed, you know, but the children were drawing pictures of the school under a big black mass. We know what happened there. The, the slag heap behind the village collapsed and buried all the kids in the school alive. It's a horrible human disaster. So it, it's a it's a very it's a very personal thing, but it's resolved and realized in a very cultural framework. So whatever culture you're raised in determines this thing. But no, I've never had any experience like that. I've never had any experience like you described of uh, the feeling of love or, you know, that, you know, or anything like that. There's also another another thing with a Nordic folklore that of a person who's old and dreams of themselves being old in the dream, because you tend when you're having a dream, you don't you don't dream your age you kind of have a universal age in every dream you have from a child up and if you dream of yourself as an old person you're going to die soon and that's another one the dream actually tell shows you you're no longer you know re- this body is no longer suited for your soul that kind of thing again i think it leads back to past lives or astral travel or even the nervous system picking up on things especially with the Abafan incident, all those children picking up on that, their nervous systems must have been picking up on it like an antenna. And obviously, they're only children, they wouldn't know what to do with that information. So it's come through as art or dreams or, or stories. There's definitely something to the nervous system part, because there are animals who seem to be acutely aware that another animal that they hunt is about to die. And they don't have to have to smell blood or anything. There's the thing of the condors, not not the condors, the vultures and the carrion in the desert following the cowboys. Now, they will tell you that those 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 vultures will suddenly appear as soon as someone starts running out of water. Then, you know, what's and what was the the only thing that changed was that the actual person crossing the desert became nervous. They became nervous. How do large numbers of ravens and crows in the olden times know a battle was about to happen and rats too that's another one we could talk about is the sudden proliferation of rats in our cities and in our um along with foxes who feed upon the rats our cities right in the middle of city centers ever since the proliferation of the 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 britney the britney spears concerts so that's another one that could also be another sort of latter day portent of debt that's also happening Yes, because we've talked about it before that the rats symbolise a breakdown in society at some level because something isn't being taken care of. Like when you see rats at the supermarket in the car parks and that, it's usually because the bins haven't been emptied or something something in the chain of command has broken down. And when so when you, you 
bring that through to society on a level of, of wars and disasters and things like that. It's almost like the rats, they know beforehand, they know when to, when to, when to appear and when to hang around for food because they just seem to know when, when the society is going to be a problem in society and that would mean that things don't get cleaned and therefore there would be food for them. Does that make sense? Yeah, they have a, they have a knowing that goes beyond, you know, smelling people sick or anything like that. They know that that it's going to happen, and hence why within the you know the pagan religions, the importance of studying, understanding, and observing auguries was so central. And and it may seem like nonsense now that the entrails of a sheep or the the liver of a calf might have been used to predict you know, an event. So suppose like they were going to, the Romans were going to attack a fort somewhere in, in Judea. Uh, they would, um, the the priests from the, the, the Lupiter cults or the Demeter cult would take the liver of a calf out and examine it for blemishes. And you say, well, that sounds ridiculous. What, how would blemishes actually guarantee if it was a success or not? Well, if you think about it, if there is, they would bring these animals with them on these uh, on these campaigns, sheep, calves, goats, and this kind of thing. And those animals might pick up in their liver, like a kind of a cellular awareness that the, there's going to be death tomorrow in the battle. They're feeling it. They, they, they have a, an animalistic sense, a kind of a synchronistic connection that way. And so... If that if that animal was feeling that over as this on this campaign, the animal might manifest it in growths or what they would call blemishes on the livers or in the intestines, and then the priest at the temple of from the temple of Lupiter Demeter would take the liver out and look at it and see, oh well, its liver is full of all these blemishes. Now, a healthy young animal should not be sick; it should not have blemishes on its liver. But if it does, does they, they, so it doesn't sound so nuts after all. It kind of makes sense if you look in, t in terms of like animal attraction, animal instincts, that, that these herd animals would pick up on impending doom and it would manifest inside their bodies in terms of an actual condition that was observable under, you know, the section. That's interesting. That, that puts me in mind of animals they have a survival instinct. So, for example, the vulture, that tends to know when death's around. If these people who are lost in the desert or in the in the woods or wherever, they, they start to circle. There's even a saying the vultures are circling and they, they seem to know. And I wonder if that is a survival instinct. It's not just that they know. It's, it's built in at a survival level. So, you know, they know they know when food is going to be available. They know when it's going to be bones to pick over. They'll eat anything. They'll eat, any animal. They'll eat us, anything that dies. Yeah, and anything that's vulnerable down in down there, they 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 seem to know, and and I don't know if they hang around waiting, just in case, or if they instinctively know that this other thing, this other animal, or even human, is 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 going to die, and there's going to be meat available that's going to feed it and its family. Well, well, I can add to that. The, the mountains near here, the tops of them are quite remote, and they were the only place you would see the large buzzards. The buzzards are enormous. They're bigger than a golden eagle. They're absolutely colossal birds. They look like an eagle, but they they actually hunt carrion. And now I'm seeing them all over the sides of the roads, all everywhere in, in the town nearby. And it's not that they're overpopulated or there's no sheep to eat or anything up in the mountains. There is. There's lots of animals still up there. But it's almost like the it's, it makes me wonder about the same thing with the, the Britney Spears conference and the possibility of all these foxes and and um, rats now taking over the cities. Are the buzzards down for the same reason? Do they have that same sense of detection? Are they the, the whippoorwills of, you know, our local mountains? Yeah, you can smell death. Death. It is said that death has a smell. It's said that certain illnesses have a smell. So perhaps they're picking up on that. And the vultures, the the foxes, the buzzards, they're circling because there is an awful lot of death around at the moment. Or they have observation. You could like you, you, you are you know pagans 
not so much now, but in the past, auguries were central to everything. Well, animals would also be aware of auguries, very much so as well. In fact, animals would probably have a far better developed sense of auguries in terms of natural changes than any human being would because they ultimately depend on survival. And they're constantly aware of a change or an anomaly in the natural world, and they make changes accordingly. I think animals are very sensitive. A case in point is the cat. The cat was used in the olden days to foretell the weather. And it wasn't that the cat was a good weatherman. It's just that they can pick up on very, very subtle changes in the atmosphere. So they would, like you say, they would make changes if it was going to rain or if it was going to snow um, or if we're going to have bad weather. And I think if there's a lot of death in the air as well, then why not? Why animals can pick up on those, that subtle, it's those subtle energies within the air as well, within the atmosphere. So I agree completely. Just to bring it from the animals, I do have another example of a ghostly premonition um, from Castle Leslie over in Ireland uh, in County Monaghan. Now, this isn't to do with the animals. This is more to do with spirit. So Castle Leslie, um, back in 1996, the owner of Castle Leslie then began to experience some paranormal activity. And they said that bells in the service hall would ring without warning and a shadowy figure could be seen walking past. And the kitchen was also full of poltergeist activity. And even the guests who stayed at the castle had reported being visited by a man with a wound on his forehead who would appear to be searching for some kind of um, documents, rooting through the drawers and things like that before fading away. And it was discovered eventually to be the ghost of Norman Leslie who'd gone off to fight in France during World War I. And I bring this up here because in October of 1914, he was seen by the lake on the castle grounds while he was alive, and the family mistook him for being home from the war. And obviously they were really excited by the news, and the servants were told to prepare his room for arrival. But he never came, and nobody could understand it because they were certain that they'd seen him there on the lake. Anyway, a week later, a telegram arrived confirming that he'd been killed in action on the same day that he was seen at the castle. That's a, that's a very common one. A soldier who, who, or a seaman who died uh, far away from home, appearing in their hometown, even meeting people. There's lots of stories of like, you know, someone would come into a town, into a pub in a city, and they say, you know, George, I thought you were in you know, Algiers, what are you doing here? And he, he would, they would sit there and be very quiet. He'd, he'd, talk, he'd just stand there. And then the next thing they'd find out, the next that he, he had died the day before or died at that moment in Algiers. Yeah, it's, like, I, it's almost like, have they, have they appeared before they've died and the soul has just astral traveled and gone over there because... From a subconscious level or a soul level, it knows it's going to be leaving the body soon. Or have they already died? And that's where they kind of go to just to, to check in on people or to go to places that meant things to them when they were alive. Either way, either way, it demonstrates that space time is arbitrary and not a fixed thing. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, it's just in this physical, in our physical realm where we're kind of tied to time. Which is probably really what this phenomenon comes down to, is that the, when someone is dead or about to die, the rules of space-time break down. Do you mean like at the quantum level? So this breakdown at the quantum level is, seems, seems to be part of the phenomena. Maybe when somebody is dying and the, the clock speed of the human brain is not so important or has died, they can travel forward or backward in time or perceive things forward and backward in time, or even tremendous stress might bring that on. If someone's worried about a loved one dying, the same might happen. So I think there's, like anything in the supernatural, all that's missing is the the scientific, like I talked about the, the auguries and the, the blemishes in the Roman animal's uh, organs. When you start thinking about it in terms of stress affecting the organ, that's, that's, that's the explanation. So a lot of the, the paranormal can be looked upon in rational terms, if you want to, as well as natural terms, both works. Yes. And I've spoken to uh, people who've had near-death experiences, and they've actually said when they've left the body, 
it was like they were everywhere all at the same time because there was no time they were just everywhere so that would make sense why these spirits or souls appear at various locations at various times when they pass over so that is ghostly premonitions about death a fascinating subject and a very real phenomenon that countless people have experienced worldwide over millennia if you ever had a ghostly premonition of death or indeed about anything else that came to pass you experience the death knocks maybe you've experienced something we haven't mentioned in the section or do you know any folklore that tells a story of ghostly entities that pretend death? Please do let us know in the comments. Pluto-Mars conjunction in Aquarius in mid-February was like the go-ahead signal for a major flare-up of derangement online and off, and unfortunately some real-life violence, as anticipated by myself and Fiona in our respective updates. March begins with this explosive conjunction separating but remaining in Aquarius until March 22nd, so things might still get quite unpleasant, especially globally. Aquarius is the sign that's concerned with society, Mars is the warrior, and Pluto represents power and the corruption thereof. So the themes definitely do check out. Let's see what awaits us in March and where we might need to put our shields up again. As always, I'm making a separate post that goes into the potentially extra difficult days. On March 10th, there is a new moon in Pisces, and on the 25th, we have a full moon in Libra, for which I will make dedicated posts for all zodiac signs. Here are the major astrological events for the upcoming month. March 10th, Mercury enters Aries. Mercury represents the mind, our speech, thoughts, how we process and communicate information, how we negotiate, trade, also writing. In the passionate, impulsive cardinal fire sign Aries, we will become more like the warrior in our thought processes and how we communicate with others, even if we are normally more cautious. This means that we could be less patient, less willing to compromise, Actually, I think we'll be pretty disinclined to do so, and we might feel a greater sense of urgency to get things done, for example, to start something new or to get some bothersome task over with. Our minds will be colored by the fire element where Mercury will be less rational and more passionate, therefore also more impatient in social interactions, especially with the presence of the North Node and Chiron in Aries. The latter signifies wounds or an area where we feel misunderstood or have a bruised ego, and on the positive side, also an area where we can develop a unique personal strength. With this placement, I'd be careful about taking things too personally or getting wrapped up in drama. I'd also caution against making any rash decisions where money is concerned. Mercury rules trade, and with impatient Aries fueling us, we might have to take a step back and spend some more time preparing and analyzing a situation before we commit to something. On the flip side, this placement can give us a more ballsy attitude, but globally we might see the build-up to some sort of escalation again. On March 11th, Venus enters Pisces. With the Sun, Saturn and Neptune also present in Pisces, which is the sign of empathy, subconscious realms and illusions and dreams, we have a strong tendency to seek out beauty and idealism, whether in romance or in general. Our need for escapism can be especially strong now and therefore a warning is in order when it comes to discernment and realism. In the boundless Piscean waters, Venus can be inclined to blend with the partner and even sacrifice herself. And conjunct Saturn and Neptune, I would be careful with idealism in romance. While it has its place and it's important to find islands of refuge for one's senses and psyche, beware of taking things at face value unconditionally, particularly when it comes to one-on-one -on -one relationships. But of course, you can let your guard down when you're in the right company. 
Venus is exalted in Pisces and no longer stressed by Uranus, which can bring a much more pleasurable atmosphere and more closeness. The positive side can bring a really dreamy and beautiful romantic mood. On March 18th, Mercury enters the pre-retrograde shadow. On March 20th, the Sun enters Aries, the sign of the warrior, who is uncompromising, a natural leader, impulsive, and, if unbalanced, quite the hothead. But in the purest form, it represents the explosive growth in spring, when everything awakens from its wintry inertia and begins its unstoppable growth. What we can harness from this sign is the courage to express ourselves and to actively go for what we want. We will start taking Aries attributes into our own lives to a degree, even if we're not usually extroverted or much of a leader personality. But it is likely that we will feel like starting something new or doing something to change the status quo in some way. Depending on our individual circumstances, this can be a huge deal or just a welcome breath of fresh air as we clear out the stuff we no longer need, clean the house, or whatever it is that we are setting our sights on. The spring equinox, which begins when the sun moves into Aries, is the astrologically correct beginning of the new year. So happy new year! The exact time is on March 19th at 11.06 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time in the U.S. and on March 20th at 5.06 a.m. Central European Time. I am issuing a major warning for March 19th onwards. On March 19th, there is a Mercury North Node Chiron conjunction in Aries, aka a stellium. A stellium is a placement of three or more bodies in a sign, and it makes the power of the sign, so to speak, much more prominent. So with Mercury, North Node, and Chiron in Aries, and with the Sun entering just one day later on March 20th, things can start getting a bit difficult globally and personally, despite some very positive dimensions that I have just addressed with Aries. The result on March 20th is a huge stellium making a sextile to Pluto, which is all about power or abuse of power, and Mars, the ruler of Aries. Mars is still in Aquarius, but only until March 22nd. The build-up to this Aries dominance can be felt a few days prior to March 19th roundabout and also in the time beyond because the strong Aries influence is active into the coming weeks with varying intensity. To give a simple overview, this sign's dominance can bring a great danger of violence, abuse or massive display of power in this constellation, sudden outbursts of anger or violence also in private as well as globally, resulting in war or a serious threat thereof. Short tempers, no diplomacy whatsoever, and no holds barred. Open aggression, possibly attacks from different groups within society whose beliefs or cultures clash, more erratic and brutal attacks, for example with knives and such, dangerous political maneuvering, natural disasters could also be in the cards, attacks or accidents involving fire are possible as well, and furthermore this extreme fire element has great implications on people's mood and health. On the positive side, there can be a higher energy in general, a heightened ability to get going with ideas, projects, etc., and to have a great drive overall. But given the global astrology, I'd say there is a lot more risk of violent outbursts than in our personal lives. However, be careful when driving or negotiating around March 19th to 22nd roundabout and a bit beyond. And very importantly, watch your temper stay away from people who can't control theirs. On March 22nd, Mars enters Pisces. The warrior archetype, the doer and mover and shaker, is now in Pisces' dreamy waters and could make us feel more adaptable, less headstrong, although of course we do have the Aries stellium going on. And our motivations, ambitions and drives could be colored by the influence of Saturn, Venus and Neptune in Pisces. In short, we might feel more easily swayed and find it harder to see clearly, impatient on the one hand, but kind of disoriented on the other, 
And we have to watch out for people who are trying to play us, especially on the global stage, but also, of course, personally. Health-wise, our metabolism could slow down because Mars governs the speed at which our bodies burn calories and is rather slow in water signs. So be careful if you're on a diet. Cheating could be felt more drastically than otherwise. Or you might put on weight inexplicably, but this will very likely pass in mid-May at the latest as Mars moves into the fuel burning Aries. Mars is a malefic and highly significant in medical astrology as he is the instigator, stimulator and bringer of acute illness. In Pisces, Mars can make us more susceptible for lymphatic infections, waterborne parasites, blood toxicity, lung weakness, adrenal fatigue or kidney issues. Also high blood pressure, back injuries, insomnia, sleep disorders, and overactive nerves. This doesn't mean that you'll get all these problems, but if you're prone to one or more of them, some extra mindfulness as to what you consume and do is a good idea. Follow me on Facebook or Instagram for frequent updates, for example, when the moon changes signs or when there is an especially challenging aspect. All the links are on my website, I will make a new video soon as well, so watch out for that. All the best, stay safe from the babblers and the ranters, and see you soon. This week's folk horror, we are reviewing the 1978 film The Medusa Touch, directed by Jack Gold and starring Richard Burton, Lino Ventura, Lee Remick and Gordon Jackson. And it's a supernatural horror thriller, which is my favourite genre. And because it's from the golden age of supernatural thrillers, the 1970s, it gave it an extra coating of dystopia. And like last week's film, The Omen, which also starred Lee Remick, the film also has a very Hitchcock feel to it. And the story revolves around John Mawler, played by Richard Burton, and he's a very troubled and reclusive writer who has the ability of psychokinesis. And the film kicks off with Mawler being subjected to a vicious assault by an unnamed intruder in his house. His investigation leads him to a psychiatrist, called Dr. Zonfield, played by Lee Remick, who had Mauler, who Mauler had been seeing due to his psychic abilities, and he was trying to understand why he had them. And she wasn't convinced, but Mauler continued to pour his innermost secrets out to her, trying to make sense of what he was capable of and why. And she thought he was delusional, and then he became more and more frustrated. And the film is a series of flashbacks recanted to the detective by the psychiatrist and other characters so that the, the, the detective can piece together the puzzle about Mauler's life. And eventually he starts to uncover a series of disturbing incidents connected to the writer's inexplicable powers. And Mauler's ability allows him to cause catastrophic events just by focusing his thoughts, leading to tragic consequences for those around him who annoy him. And the film shows that he got the ability by praying to the devil when he was a child because his nanny would frighten him with her Bible stories of damnation. But I thought it would have been more plausible that he already had the ability of telekinesis and he developed that ability naturally, which grew stronger with each injustice that he faced and eventually becoming egregorial and so strong that he lost control of it. And in the end, it was controlling him and couldn't be destroyed. Well, one scene that stood out to me mostly, because I remembered seeing it, watching this film as a child, was the scene with the aeroplane when he finally proved to the psychiatrist that he does have the ability to control events and death. And I vividly remember that scene of the plane losing control as it was about to land and it rather eerily went into a tower block. And 
it wasn't it was a good film. It wasn't a great film. It could have been 20 minutes shorter and made it a better film. But it was a good story with a great cast. And when we met Mauler's wife and saw that she was having an affair with a flamboyant theatrical type right under his nose, I realised that was Jeremy Brett of Sherlock Holmes fame from, I think it was the 1980s. And there was also an appearance from Derek Jacobi who was a ringer for Noel Edmonds in this film, I had to look twice. And so it was cheesy in, in certain places. But you do feel for Mola as we go back over his life and you can see that he's delusioned and disappointed in humanity and the system. And how many of us feel like that at the moment? So you really can put yourself in the character's shoes and empathise with him in parts. And overall, I'd give it a 7 out of 10. It's a good story and a fabulous cast, but it's a bit too long with unnecessary scenes and a bit cheesy in places, but it is entertaining. Yes, Sarah, this is the first time I've seen this uh, film and it was only upon your recommendation. And I have to say, I, I was very impressed by what I saw. Uh, it's not perfect, but it has a lot going for it. I really like the 70s vibe of it too, especially it's set in London as most of The Omen was, uh, but unlike The Omen, it didn't feel as Hollywood. It was a bit more dark and gritty, like a, a British spy story or detective story. Like it had that look of the Day of the Jackal or something like that about it. Richard Burton, I thought, was superb, and he's probably playing himself. He was quite belligerent and grumpy. And I think that the character dynamic between the French policeman, who was this kind of like Cousteau-type character, but not as goofy, over trying to you know figure him out was very very good especially at the end when he realizes that this guy is not actually dead or dying his brain waves are actually showing how he's actually functioning he's actually able to project beyond his body and the brain wave on the brave on the brain monitor on the ekg or wherever it is or inside the hospital is how he it figures out eventually what's going on i thought all oh, that was very well done I, I, the relationship with the psychiatrist was a bit strange. I couldn't quite put my finger on that. The relationship there is almost like, was she into it with him or a, a kind of thing? Was that time it almost seemed kinky, like she was being turned on by he had the possibility to actually, you know, destroy people through his brain power. I loved how he described his childhood. That was poss possibly the best part of the of the of the superfluous when i say superfluous outside the main story additions where he shows the nanny who's a monster who tortures him with stories of hellfire and this kind of thing and then his parents who he doesn't are not particularly likable people and what happens there is really that's kind of like a, 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 a moment that changed him as a person he kind of be, he be kind of became a kind of a devil like figure and then he, he kind of, like you said, egregoric, he kind of magicked himself into it. The the look of London in that period, I thought, was great. I love the look of all the old cars and that kind of thing. I think Richard Burton was a strange character for this film because he was a superstar when that was made. And yet, he, this is kind of has a, it's a B movie when you think about it. And all in all, I have to say, eight out of 10 for the Medusa touch. And uh, I agree with your, your own review almost identically. And it's definitely worth watching, and it's 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 a it's a very good film. It's a very hocus focus film. So it's a very good film for this show, or the, 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 and the ethos of this show. It has ontology. It has supernatural. It has you know the the even like the serial killer elements are there. And yes, the scene of the plane crashing, I like the way they built up with that because they drive by the devastation. And you don't know whether it's a gas explosion or an IRA bomb or what's caused it. And then you realize, and they show it, and it was very well done. I thought the scene where the, the special effects part of the plane hitting the building, I thought that was very well done, that scene. And it, reminded, it had a 9-11 kind of vibe, which is kind of a bit spooky as well. But yes, um, The Medusa Touch, a very, very good film. And uh, not fantastic, but absolutely one. If I saw the DVD, I'd have it in my library. I like Richard Burton. I like his strong, commanding voice and the way he delivers his lines. And he could be given the crappy script and he just breathes life into it. But then I get I like males with strong, commanding voices. And I hold Burton in the same esteem 
esteem as Oliver Reed, one of the greats of the golden age of cinema. Big, t- big time, because that film could have been made with another actor and probably wouldn't have it, it had the same impact. In the same way Oliver Reed in, I think it was These Are the Damned, where he was played the gang leader. I mean, he basically floated that film out of mediocrity into something quite deep. And Richard Burton did the same in the Medusa touch. He did, especially in the scene where he had the job as a barrister and he was in the um, court and he had the he had the um, the outfit on and the wig on and he had hold of it like this and he was strutting up and down with his chest out and he was really giving it some in, in that scene. He was it was true Richard Burton. He, he was great in it, I thought. I actually, he made you feel for the character Mauler when we look back on his life, all the injustices that he'd encountered, especially when the headmaster or the school teacher said he had to pick up several thousand leaves and come back to the office and they would be counted. And if there was one more or one less, he'd have to go out and do it all again. So you, you could understand why he, um, he, he was like he was. I mean, he caused a space mission to fail. He killed his parents with a runaway car. He attacked yeah, a nuclear reactor. Wife. Yes, he did. And and he brought down the cathedral while all the heads of state were inside. And, and by the end of the film, you realise that there was nothing that he wouldn't do to avenge the state of the world. And he kind of reminded me of that character, um, uh, we're not going to take this anymore. What was that? That network. network. Yeah, that was uh, Peter Finch. Yes, it was that kind of character, but not as vocal. He did it very quietly. Howard Beale was his name of the character in that. Yeah, that's right. Howard Beale. Yeah, switch off your television sets. Yeah, him. And you just you kind of felt for him because he felt like a lot of us do today. And how many of us can put our hands on our heart and say that if we could do the same as Mauler, we wouldn't be tempted to do it. The special effects for the cathedral collapsing was very well done too. I really thought that was very good. And it, it, the, fact that, the fact that they chose to do it at night added to the drama, the way they lit up the gargoyles crumbling and collapsing. The film really has it all. It has supernatural ontology and it's even a disaster movie. And it's also a, a psychological uh, profile of this character and all the things in his life that led him to where he beca- what he became, what he is. There was one scene in it that was quite uncomfortable and it was the scene with the next door neighbour and the wife. Do you remember when he brought some fish home for dinner and she was a real nasty piece and real nagging, horrible wife? And um, she was giving him the usual monologue about how he was useless and um, he was good for nothing. And she'd gone to the window and opened it and said, you know, I think I'll just go now and end it all because you're no good. And the husband had come to the door and I just so I felt for him so much. He came to the door and he said, it's all right. I'll open a tin of ravioli. It'll be all right. And I thought, oh, this poor character. <laughs> absolutely awful and then because of the shouting because the wife was literally um a bitter old fish wife you had Mola who another borderline another door. borderline yeah yeah and, and he was sick of the arguing Mola, and he actually sat there at his desk because he was a writer and he wanted some peace and quiet and all he could hear was her going on about this fish and she threatened to unalive herself i have to say that because it's youtube and um he just said, oh, just do it if you're going to do it. And then it hypnotised her and she did it. I thought that was quite a disturbing scene. Yeah, so go out and see the Medusa Touch. You'll, you, you will enjoy it. Don't expect to be swept off your feet by it. But at the same time, too, it could have deeper layers to it. It might be one of these films, and I think it is, that I've only seen it the once. But if I was to watch it again, I'd probably find new things. Yeah, that was the Medusa Touch. Have you seen it before? What did you think? Or are you going to watch it? And if you do, then please come back here and let us know in the comments what you think of the film. The film is Hauntology Central and watching it again brought back the same eerie feelings as watching it back then. And if you like all supernatural horror thrillers from the 70s, then you're really going to enjoy this one.
So it's a very strange period right now after Christmas. Early 2024 seems to be filled with a lot of challenges, a lot of personal challenges, a lot of emotional and psychological channel challenges. And uh, I'm encountering a lot of people who are out of sorts right now. Uh, does Sarah, our psychic hygienist, have the answer to this? Help is coming, or is she going to tell us about something else? Either way, it'll be bloody good, and you want to hear it. It's the Psychic Hygiene with Sarah. This week, I was sat by an open fire and staring into it, thinking about what to write for this month's psychic hygiene. And as I was staring into the flames, I started to think about how the discovery of fire was a significant milestone in human history. And it allowed early humans to create heat, cook food and protect themselves from predators by lighting fires at the entrances to caves. And fire was a game changer that revolutionised how humans lived and interacted with their environment. And as I sat there thinking about the significance of fire, I couldn't help but think about the sun, the ultimate fireball that sustains all life on this planet. The sun's heat and life-giving rays are essential to the survival of all living beings on Earth. Without the sun, life as we know it wouldn't exist. And beyond its practical uses, fire is also a powerful metaphor for passion. Passion is the fire that drives humans to be better to better themselves and strive for greatness and it inspires us to pursue our dreams and overcome obstacles and achieve our goals. And as fire can be both destructive and life-giving, so can passion be a source of inspiration and a force to be reckoned with. Fire is also associated with the phrase fire in the belly, meaning a deep and burning desire or motiv motivation that comes from within. And that inner drive also keeps us going, even when things get tough. Have you ever felt a deep desire for something that makes your heart race and your breathing quicken? That's passion. And it's an intense feeling that can come from within. And it can be sparked by external events. And it's not just about sex, although that's one of the ways of experiencing it. But passion can motivate you to take action and pursue your goals. And if you feel like something is missing in your life, it may be a lack of passion. So this month, take some time to figure out what you're passionate about and to find ways to express it. Don't limit yourself and don't let anyone else limit you. Let your passion ignite a flame within you and make your life more fulfilling. When we have fire in the belly, we're filled with passion and purpose and we become unstoppable. So let your passion ignite a fire in your belly think about the things you enjoy doing in your in your spare time what, what activities make you feel happy and fulfilled what topics do you find yourself reading about or talking about with others these can all be clues to your passions sometimes our passions lie outside of our comfort zones in that case challenge yourself by trying new activities and experiences you might discover a new hobby or interest that you're passionate about when you're doing something you're passionate about, feeling a sense of excitement and motivation is natural. So pay attention to those emotions and use them as a guide to help you identify what lights your fire. So no matter how bad the world seems at the moment or how cold and dull the weather is or has been, don't allow external forces to extinguish the fire in your belly. The powers that be would like to see our internal fires put out and there has never been a more important time to keep your inner flame alive and fuel it with things that you're passionate about. And that is my psychic hygiene for this month. Yes, fire. That's a bit of a, a, bit of a, a synchronicity there. I was looking for the book to review tonight and one of them that I picked up two and the one I didn't decide to review was a book of infrared photographs of Irish castles and the one on the cover is the one that you two used for their album The Unforgettable Fire so a nice bit of uh, synchronicity there fire agni uh, in the Hindu word agni is the root word in Vedic and Indo-European of ignition ignite and it relates to the internal fire within 
So, yeah, I mean, it's the internal fire, the agony inside us that sustains us through the dark periods of uh, winter, not just on a, you know, an actual physical level, but on a psychological level as well. So very good. That was an excellent uh, hygiene tip, Sarah. Thank you. And in the words of Jim Morrison, come on, baby, light my fire. Yep. And actually, you two's first appearance on Top of the Pops was their single fire in 1981. One of the classic Fortean events that people have long talked about and kind of became a benchmark for the development of Fortiana is the strange phenomenon of unusual objects falling out of the sky. We've all heard out of the we've all heard about frogs coming down and around the town. There's lots there's even videos of them live on YouTube now. People get their camera phones out and record them. When I was growing up, these kinds of frog falls, fish falls, there was no camera phones. So there was no records of them really back then. And there was still an element of, is it real or is it not? Is it a, is it a, you know, a made up story that a, that a truckload of fish, the fish fall out of it onto the road. And it, it wasn't until people were able to start filming these things on their camera phones that this phenomenon of strange things falling out of the sky began to happen. Now, you could understand what makes frogs, fish fall out of the sky. Obviously, there was some kind of cyclone, tornado, hurricane that scooped the fishes up in their sea or scooped the frogs up in the pond and they were rained down on top of a community or a town somewhere else. That makes a lot of sense. Even the ones when you have freshwater and seawater fish raining down in the same fish falls, that could have been a tornado that passed over a lake or a river estuary into the sea and collected up both kinds of fish. There's even stories of golf balls, a quite a common one in Florida, falling from the sky. Again, that could make sense. Why is it hundreds of golf balls? Where are the hundreds of golf balls stored? It's not like, you know, I know Florida is famous for golf courses, but you'd have to have hundreds of golf balls on the ground to be picked up. And why only golf balls? Why not other objects of a similar weight? Why not mice co coming down with the golf balls or something else? Meat. Meat has also, also been recorded falling out of the sky. That was completely edible. How did that happen? The stories of that they could have been meat being carried by carrion, like our friend the buzzards we mentioned earlier on the show, and so on, or birds of prey, but not specific sizes of meat, segments of them. And this has gone back long before airlines and aviation. And they've been dropped down and people able to pick them up, cook them and eat them and saying that it tastes like venison or mutton. There's also been blood. How did blood rain from the sky? And you could say, well, in some cultures, they use blood to fertilize the fields. They will use the animal blood as a fertilizer. And that's definitely true, that animal blood, and in the case of the red robin, human blood is a very good fertilizer for crops. And you could say all those things are explainable in the context of weather patterns or weather fronts, cyclones, hurricanes, tornadoes, picking these things up and dropping them somewhere else. That would be enough to explain the strangeness of things falling from the sky. How do you explain what happened in 1922? in a town called Chico in California. Now, before I get to the Chico story, I want to talk about how this stuff entered into popular consciousness. Well, none other than the granddaddy and the mentor and the, the point of origin of all this stuff that we do on Hocus Focus and 40 in Times, the great Charles Fort. He wrote a book in 1919 called The Book of the Damned, 
which was a very big seller at the time. And he documented all these cases of strange objects falling from the sky. And that was probably what solidified into a compendium of all these stories that had been whispered about, spoken about urban legends all over the world up until that point. Now we had an actual record of them. Three years later, 1922, the residents of a town, which is now a city, called Chico in California, at 3 p.m. every afternoon, rocks would fall from the sky. The residents became so wary of them, it was just during one summer, that they ran indoors when the rocks would come down on the main street. The obvious thing was that there was a belief and possibility that someone may have had a trabuse or a catapult, a prank, and there is a, there was a lot of universities and colleges there, even in the early days, and students were doing it for a laugh. Aside from the fact what they were doing was extremely dangerous. One of those, the stones ranged from the size of a pebble all the way up to about this size could have killed somebody the stones came vertically out of the clear blue sky they weren't meteorites because they were cold to the touch or they were not hot they had not been through the atmosphere they showed no no signs of scorching they were stones of every possible geological type a an engineer and some scientists from the u.s government went out to chico hearing this story to debunk it. And they were also under, uh, under the assumption that, that someone was firing them into Chico using a catapult. But this would have meant they would come in at an angle. The U.S. government people in Chico determined that the locals were correct, that at 3 p.m. every day, stones came directly out of the sky, raining on the center of Chico that were not meteorites, and it was actually happening. And after that, the end of the summer, it never happened again. So we can tell you explain that. The strange anomalies of things falling from the sky can, can on the surface seem to be explainable, debunkable, but not what happened in Chico. And it's not the only one that's been like that. So Sarah, have you ever looked into this this took this topic first touched upon by Charles Fort. So I know a water spout or whirlwind uh, can cause some of these instances, but even those explanations are not without their anomalies and questions. Whirlwinds would lift everything up. So why are there no falls of an assortment of things altogether, such as debris um, and everything else that would have been sucked up with it? And why are things so neatly separated to only falls of fish or only frogs or only jelly-like substances. And in the case of the fish falling, with fish being sort of attributed to whirlwinds and other such like natural phenomena, the fish are actually alive when they land. So if they're sucked up by a whirlwind, then how do they survive that? So for me, even the more rational explanations are not without the shortcomings. And I've looked into other possibilities because I, I've kind of followed this on and off through the 40 and times. Um, and there's lots of other possibilities out there. And some of them are supernatural phenomena, such as spirits and poltergeist activities. And even gods that were believed to have caused the fall of fish in places that were in need of them. Downpours of fish have been happening annually in a place called Yoro in the Hon Honduras. And the people there actually prepare buckets and nets in anticipation of this happening at the beginning of every rainy season. That phenomenon occurs up to four times a year. And others believe that some of the falls could be alien ships sucking up objects and then putting them back when they finished studying them for zoological reasons, or that it could be things from other planets that they've dropped here for one reason or another. And then there's time warps or parallel worlds that interact with our own. So perhaps the opposite happens there. And objects are seen being sucked up into the air before we see them mysteriously fall down in our world. So I approach the topic with an open mind. There's no evidence to the more out there suggestions. But as with any 40 and thinker, all possibilities stay on the table until proven otherwise. And it's basic physics that what goes up must come down and... 
Speaking of the possibility of parallel worlds, there was an incident of the reverse happening in our world. And that was on the 29th of June in 1842 in Cooper, Scotland. And it was a woman who was washing clothes in a tub when she heard a loud noise overhead, followed by a strong gust of wind. And the cattle in the area were frightened and they started running around in fear. And the woman saw the clothes on the ground. But there was an area where some of the curtains and sheets were being lifted upwards to these enormous heights until they couldn't be seen any longer. And then when the violent wind stopped, the cows were all huddled together, so like, in, like they were in terror and didn't know what was going on. But what was even more strange than that was that the heaviest articles of clothing were pinned to the ground to stop them from being blown away while she worked. But the wind unpinned those items Yet the lighter items of clothing and bedding were never moved and were never touched by the wind. Again, the whole thing with the, the fish. Not only should there be lots of other things with the fish brought up, but also what about when it's individual species of just one fish? You've had very specific fish falls, which were just herring. There's more than herring in the sea. There's more than sardines in the sea. So that's another weird one that these fish arrive as specific um, species. Another one you could throw in, and I'm like yourself, I'm open to all of it, is the concept that there are oceans from other planets floating around outside the Earth. And occasionally these oceans hit the Earth's surface and there's frozen fish from other planets or maybe even a catastrophe to happen on this planet out there and they come down every so often. And there, you know, we have stories of the I'm Emmanuel Velikovsky's catastrophism, where the actual water of the earth came from actually Venus when it was transversing between Mars orbital area and where it currently sits right now. And it fell down on the earth and brought the oceans of Venus down with it. I mean, I'm open to all kinds of things. It could be still remnants of those oceans out there. We do not have the watery moon. Europa of Jupiter ejects water geysers into space from its under from its oceans underneath the ice. There could be animals living in that. I've even theorized the concept that's maybe where the octopuses came from, because they're so different genetically than anything else on this planet. So there you go. I mean, it's a it's a, it's a you think you can solve that one right away. You really can. But then it just gets more peculiar and more strange the more you look into even things like coins. And even antique coins coming down in their hundreds, or even money in cash coming down. You could say this has happened before airplanes existed. It, it's a very, very peculiar and strange phenomenon that has yet to be, I think, adequately explained in terms of like looking from the rational way. I agree with you. All the cards are still on the table. Speaking about a space, I was um, very interested in the phenomenon of star jelly which i read i've read about, oh, quite a lot about and it's said to be deposited on the earth during meteor showers and it's described as a translucent or grayish white gelatin that tends to evaporate short, shortly after it's fallen to the ground and there's been lots of explanations about that which have gone from it being the remains of frogs toads or worms um, or masses of amoeba called slime molds now, on the evening of the 3rd of November 1996, a meteor was reported flashing across the sky of a place called Kempton in Tasmania. And the next morning, a white translucent slime was discovered all over the lawns and the pavements or the sidewalks of the town. And another incident of this strange star jelly was in 1950 with four Philadelphia policemen who reported the discovery of a domed disc of quivering jelly six feet in diameter. And I've actually got the newspaper clipping for that here. Um, and it's it's quite an interesting, an interesting story. Yeah, I'd like to hear that. All right, excuse me. I'll have to take these off to read the paper. Showing me age now. Okay, so police officers John Collins and Joe Keenan were cruising the streets of Philadelphia as their patrol car on the night of September the 26th, 1950. And they made their way down a quiet side street near Vare Avenue and 20th, 26th Street. 
and the headlights picked up a strange shimmering object that seemed to be coming to earth in an open field about half a block ahead of them. When they went to investigate with flashlights, it revealed a dome disc of quivering purple jelly, six feet in diameter, one foot thick near the centre and an inch or two around the edge. They had a curious feeling that the thing was alive. So they turned off the flashlights and they saw it glow with a faint purple light and then they radioed for help. And they were soon joined by Sergeant Joe Cook and Patrolman James Cooper. And Sergeant Cook suggested that they try to pick the thing up. But when Officer Collins attempted to do this, it fell apart in his hands like gelatin. And the fragments that stuck to his hands soon evaporated, leaving behind only a sticky, odorless scum. And within half an hour after Cook and Cooper arrived on the scene, the whole thing had evaporated and disappeared. And apparently, according to this newspaper report, it inspired the 1958 film The Blob, that incident. Well, it does have that uh, Quaker Mass Doctor Who vibe to it, that story. You wonder how many things have actually we take for granted on this planet didn't originate here. They came, they, they said, when we're down in the world of the panspermia thing here, but how many things actually have arrived on asteroids, meteorites and comets? There's been lots of tests done on this jelly over, over centuries now, and some of the results say it's from frogs and birds, but other tests say, actually a test commissioned by the National Geographic Society say that no DNA was found in it, and it was concluded to be some kind of inorganic material. So nobody's been able to confirm exactly what this stuff, this star jelly is, or where it comes from, except that it appears to fall from the sky. And I also think it's possible that some of the Fortean Falls could be things which we've created with our minds too, like an egregore. And um, yes, you, you, another you, case... Sorry, uh, the egregore thing reminded me of that the, the sightings of these things happening intensified following the publication and popularity of Charles Fourth book, uh, The Book of the Damned, documenting these things. So that would be probably in the error. You could say, OK, well, there's more people reporting them. I think that could be egregoric as well. I think when you take notice of a paranormal or Fortean phenomena in that kind of ontological way, it comes into manifestation. I've got another case here, which I think was egregorial. It's it's a perfect case in point for it being possible. And it was in 1975, and I mentioned this in a previous episode, um, a large block of ice in 1975 fell through the roof of the Melkis's home in Bedford, England. And that you could write that off to it falling from an aeroplane. But at the time it happened, when this ice dropped through the ceiling, the family were watching a movie about the Titanic and at the moment the ice crashed through the ceiling, it was the exact point in the movie where the ship was about to hit the iceberg. Now, did they psychically create that by being so engrossed in the movie, or was it just an uncanny coincidence? I'm pretty sure I remember that story from Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious Worlds. And, and even doing this topic with you, um, I had a, a major synchronicity happen when I was researching through this topic. And that was that I'd finished my reading and making notes for the show. And I just, in particular, that story about the police officers seeing the big um, purple gelatinous blob of jelly that had landed from, from the sky. And that very same evening that I'd been reading about that, my husband had said, do you fancy watching a movie of HP Lovecraft? I've got it here. And uh, I said, yeah, okay, let's have a look. And it was actually the colour out of space with Nicola C Nicolas Cage about a piece of gel gelatinous space material. But in that story, it's actually pink, not purple, and it falls from the sky. And it's an absolutely brilliant film, but I won't say much about it here because I'd love for us to do a review on that in a future edition. But it was just uncanny that I'd read a story about it happening in, in real life and then to go downstairs later and um, to be set, to be asked, do you want to watch this movie about um, this H.P. Lovecraft story that I've got here with Nicolas Cage? I love H.P. Lovecraft, love Nicolas Cage. It was a no-brainer, and it just so happened it was about the exact same thing. Well, speaking about, you know, the concept of the fish being whipped up in a hurricane or a storm and synchronicities, and also spoke about Renfield hurricanes, tsunamis, I woke up this morning and I, honest to God, this is true. 
the first thing that popped into my head was the song by the Scorpions, Rock You Like a Hurricane. Now, I love that song. I absolutely love it. But I don't play it that much. I've been singing the song in the back of my head all day. And I just between this recording of this previous section of Hocus Focus and the last one, I looked on onto Facebook and up on the the rock the the rock the rock history page, Rocky Like a Hurricane by the Scorpions was released exactly forty years ago today. You've obviously tapped into something. Yeah, the word hurricane. The, yeah, and then rocks, rocks falling from the sky. It's 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 you know what what you know how, I mean I'm not even a huge fan of the Scorpions although I thought I grew, that song reminds me of the happiness of the eighties, but it's a kind of like a synchronicity slash what we were doing on Hocus Focus tonight and also a bit of a wave function collapse wave <laughs> as well. That actually says to me that um, for you to have that synchronicity and me to have that one with the movie that there is more to it than just simple scientific explanations yes some of them might be simple scientific explanations even those raise questions but i think a lot of it goes way beyond that as well oh yeah and that we're on the right track and you yeah absolutely absolutely that's the universe saying continue on this path you're right 100%. 100%. If it's all right with you, I've got three very small uh, newspaper clippings here. Very, very punchy, very quick newspaper clippings about strange falls. Pennies and half pennies fell around children leaving school in Hannam, a suburb of Bristol, England, one day in 1956. Then thousands of 1,000 franc notes rained down in France in 1957. No one claimed the notes or reported any loss of money. A light crossed the night sky over the Irish county of Westmeath in February 1958 and was seen to land in a field. A number of people rushed to the site where they found only a mass of gelatinous material. That's another incident of weird gelatinous material. And so it goes on. I've got loads of them here. Lots and lots of stuff. Yeah, uh, just literally, you'd have to go to a list of things that haven't fallen out of the sky. That haven't. That haven't, because just about everything else you could possibly think of has rained down somewhere. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, it would be quicker just to yeah talk about what hasn't rather than what has. Yeah, it's such a common and, and such a universal phenomenon. It's probably the granddaddy of all Fortean stories, really, when you think about it. Absolutely, and and H.P. Lovecraft had a piece. He had a slice of that cake in lots of his stories. He was obsessed with the gelatinous stuff coming from outer space. So that makes me wonder: did he experience some strange falls? Absolutely, yeah. Fortean falls. We should do a H.P. Lovecraft special just on on Hocus Focus and nothing else. And maybe when we get around to reviewing the Color Out of Space, we'll do a whole H.P. Lovecraft special. I would like that. Yeah, I would like that a lot. So that's it. Strange objects from space and from the sky coming down and landing in the form of fish, money, golf balls, blood, and everything else you could imagine. There is no way you can easily discredit or debunk this story because this is the strangeness of it, the actual specific nature of the things that fall. It's they're too specific to be just random things caught up in a storm. So if you have any theories about this that we haven't covered on this, we'd love to hear it. And if you've ever seen any of these things, let us know, because it's a very, very common thing. And I'm sure at least one of you have had this experience. Strange objects falling from the sky. Uh, The possibly the rock around the clock of the Fortiana. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on to your four leaf clovers and grab your Enfield Rain Max. Whether it's raining cats and banshees or the sun is shining like a pot of gold, our favourite Irish weatherman has got you covered. It's Thomas with the Psychic Weather. Oh, 
Hello, the psychic water, raincoats. How about a dam? How about the dikes that they build in Holland to hold back the North Sea? This is the level of rent fielding we're dealing with right now. Everybody's reporting it. Uh, no one wants to go outside because they're dealing with it. It is off the scale. It's a very weird kind of rent fielding as well. And I've also noticed that people who are prone to addictions issues are, are not even that. People who don't even drink that much have been hitting the bottle and having really bad nights and hangovers, including myself after an, over a month of not having touched any beer. And uh, so there's definitely, a, there's definitely something not very good going on. It's kind of dark. It's kind of wicked. And uh, I don't like what I'm seeing out there. I don't like what I'm seeing online. And my best advice regarding this is to uh, build a dike and, ha and, and get behind it uh, because it seems to be going for a little bit longer than usual. It's been running now for about two weeks. And I think it's probably going to run maybe for the whole of March. So um, the psychic weather this month is... Renfield alert, you know, and um, what's the best is the best way to protect yourself from Renfielding out there? And I was even Renfielding myself. I realized that the other day I was actually got into an argument with someone online and I realized, holy shit, I'm actually Renfielding. So it goes to show you that even your weatherman can be affected by it. Don't engage, lay low, stay away build a dike, get behind it, and don't look over it. And that's the psychic weather. When I was listening to you um, read that, I was just making a few notes here of things that were relevant and I've actually written down here I was Renfielding myself I've been Renfielding myself too and I thought oh gosh I was I've been a real pain in the ass so I've um kept quiet I've just kept quiet because like, whatever I say people take seem to take it the wrong way and then I think are they taking it the wrong way or is it me that's Renfielding I don't know so I'm just keeping quiet it's horrible out there you post memes or you make comments and people take them the wrong way um and people that usually are quite prone to having a laugh at a meme seem to be taking it to heart so i don't know what's going on out there but i'm just taking it easy and laying a bit low yeah i think those of us who are not normally prone to ren feeling we almost do it as a kind of a a defense mechanism during these high intensity ren fielding events i don't want to be a ren field but hey you know I have been, and if I've Renfielded anybody out there, I'm sorry. <laughs> the thing is that when we, when it happens to us, we recognise it right away and we stop it. The the regular Renfields, they 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 can't help it. They're in kind of Renfield NPC zone, and they're it just that's how they are. They won't. That's what makes them useful, by the way. Yes, good weather veins and good um, specimens to absolutely, absolutely predictions. And now we come to the book review section. And this month, Thomas and I have cracked open the spines of two books that have had a deep impact on us. And it's at this point in the show that we indulge in a bit of show and tell to inspire you for your next edition to your own 40 and bookshelves. And as always, we put our affiliate links to the books in the review in the description box. And if you wish to purchase them via our links, we'll get a few pennies to put back into future content creation. And my book this month is The Law of the Land, A Guide to England's Legends. And that is by Jennifer Westwood and Jacqueline Simpson. And it's a very, very detailed book that covers a vast range of folklore, legends, uh, ghost stories and paranormal tales. And the book is organised alphabetically by the counties in England, which makes it easy to locate and find specific information. And at over 900 pages, this hefty book is a comprehensive reference guide and a good doorstop that provides an in-depth look into the traditions and stories that have kind of shaped England's heritage. And while it may not be suited for reading from cover to cover, it is a valuable resource for anyone interested in the history and legends of England. 
Now, when you go on holiday and you stay in a hotel, they always have pamphlets of things to do and where to go. Well, this book is kind of like that for the person who likes to travel to different places of interest within a county or city. And whenever I visit places in England, if I'm going to be there for a few days, I use this book to explore and learn about the local legends and folklore. And there's something really special about reading a tale or legend about a particular place before actually experiencing it in person and then actually walking the same path as the characters in the stories. Now, this book's helped me to make most of my, the most of my travels and discover new stories and legends that I might have otherwise missed. And it covers stories from that surround many sites and many places from everyday sort of places uh, to megaliths and then back to towns and local pubs. And it is a brilliant read and it is absolutely jam-packed full of the lore of Albion. And if you're a resident in England, you're likely to find your own town or city covered in the book along with local legend that you might not have known existed. And I'm off to London in April and I've already picked a few places from the book that I want to visit to make detailed videos about for the channel for a future future video. And there's also, because of this book, one county in particular that I want to visit, and that's Rutland. And it's absolutely steeped in folklore. And I just love to visit the turf maze at Wing, which is a 12 metre wide monument of low turf banks, which creates a maze. And if you love folklore and legend, you're going to love this book. It's thoroughly researched. It's filled with full colour, glossy photographs and illustrations, which I'll show you a few in a moment. And these things just bring the story to life. So whether you're a seasoned enthusiast or just starting to explore the world of folklore, this book is going to inspire you. And... I'll just quickly do a quick flick through. There's the maze that I want to go and visit in Rutland at Wing in Rutland. And 900 pages of folklore, paranormal tales, ghost stories. Everything is in here. And yeah, it's all alphabetical from county to county. Fabulous book. I love those kinds of books, regardless of the country that they're set in. I just want, I just love that stuff. That that's um, that's definitely going to be on my list. It's very very similar. What's the name of that artist that had a speaking gig at the Mysterious Earth? I bought one of his books. He did the symbols. Peter Knight. Oh. He, uh, yes, his other book that he did about the um, going around Albion with his with his partner or his business partner, who uh, the the lady that that he was with. It's a little bit like that, but. It just covers England and it's 900 pages. A lot of stuff in there. My book this week is an art book. I think Sarah's done a couple of art books so far and I haven't done one. I'm not aware of it, I remember. And my book is The Paintings of Charles Burchfield, North by Midwest. Now, if you haven't heard of Charles Burchfield, I'm a huge fan of American painters and artists from the last century. Charles Burchfield was a wallpaper designer from upstate New York, Pennsylvania. He moved around a bit, who was a, a ferocious painter at the time of the Great Depression in America. And he painted from that period on until the 1960s, when his painting style changed into an almost psychedelic form before the psychedelic thing took off. His paintings have a beautiful spiritual quality to them. There's a simplicity to them. They're usually just done with gouache or with watercolors. Think of Edward Hopper stripped down to a simple form. He's in that way, but a deeper, richer dive. There's a tremendous sense of ontology, particularly his paintings of industrial cities and towns in America at that period. He started off by painting very straightforward, almost watercolors and illustrations of what they call the Rust Belt, Ohio, upstate New York, Pennsylvania, the industrial heartland of America. But 
there's a beautiful sense of melancholy. This one here is called one of my favorite paintings of all time. It's just a street on a normal American street, but it's called Yellow Afterglow. Just with these simple geometric shapes and of this street, he is he captures the kind of melancholy ontological sadness of the old industrial American heartland of the East and the Midwest. Uh, there's often they're like that. Uh, there's one here where he paints a storm, and you see how it's it looks like the whole town is being blown away. So he had a tremendous sense of the psychological elements of what makes, and he was quite a proficient painter. He could paint with great detail when he wanted to, but he changed. And his tr his paintings of trees, particularly, are very electrifying. Uh, they show the trees as as almost alive energy forces coming out of them. And they become increasingly, as he aged, they became increasingly psychedelic. Uh, Borchfield's paintings are mostly watercolors, so they were not always on display. And there wasn't many human figures in his paintings. He would paint, for instance, the toll of a church bell at night in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an American town in terms of the sound waves echoing from them. His paintings to me and his artwork are very, very compatible with the stories of H.P. Lovecraft. There's this, you know, in another world, this is Arkham, this is Innsmouth, this is paintings of the psychedelic elements of these paintings are just quite incredible. It's this rainstorm one where he paints what look like giant flowers and cats in the sky. And um, he's definitely been the artist that has influenced me in so many things. So the paintings of Charles Borchfield, North by Midwest, uh, I'm not saying you can get this book. It's kind of hard. It's quite expensive. I've seen it online. Get to know the art. If you're if you're a, a Lovecraftian fan, get to know the artwork of Charles Burchfield because that kind of regionalism Americana, the America not of the Wild West and California, but the America of the dreary New England mill town on a February morning with the smell of coal and the steam train in the background and men working long shifts, the, the, the paintings of the emotions of a rainy night in Ohio in 1925 during the Depression, it's all here. So if you don't get this book, it's basically an advertisement for the a promo by me for the artwork of Charles Burchfield, in my opinion, America's greatest painter. Thank you for that. I'm going to check him out because I've not heard of him. So, yes, that's one of the first things I'm going to do when I have a look at his artwork. And you mentioned he was a wallpaper designer. Yeah, that's what he did for a living. He worked for a factory. He worked for a few factories, but he in upstate New York. Now, he wasn't kind of a, a fairly acclaimed painter by to the end of his life. But uh, there's a beautiful humanity in him. When he was dying, I think he died of a gallbladder infection. He was in agony. And he wrote that of all the things that ever ha when I look back on my life, I can only think of when I was a boy, how I, I, I killed a mouse and I'm now being punished for it. Or I, I, un I finally empathize with the death of that mouse. And um, so, you know, there's a lot of depth in there, but it's not the America of it's not the America of sunshine, lollipops and Corvettes. It's the America that we rarely see pictured, but like it's the America of the background. The, the landscape that would have been around Providence when Lovecraft was there. Thank you for that. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, you amazing bunch of 40ians. We can't express enough gratitude for all the love, support, likes, shares and positive vibes that you've just showered upon us and our individual channels. Seriously, you guys rock and we couldn't do it without you. A special shout out to everyone who participated in the live chat last week. It was an absolute blast. Again, seeing all of you dive into the 40 and rabbit hole together, exchanging ideas, theories, and just having a good time. And we really hope those connections continue to flourish and grow into fantastic friendships. You guys are the heart and soul of this community. So here's a big virtual hug and a heartfelt thank you for being part of this 40 and tribe. 
And please spread the word far and wide about Hocus Focus. Tell your friends, tell your family and your neighbours. Let's keep this party and party going strong. Next month, we're back on the first Sunday of the month, which will be the 7th of April. And we will have another mind boggling episode full of high strangeness. Trust us, you won't want to miss what we have in store for that one. So stay curious, stay weird. And remember that the truth is out there waiting to be uncovered. Uh, thanks, everybody, for pushing the Christmas special over into five figures so soon. We weren't expecting that, especially considering how bloody long that show was. So Sarah's hard work has definitely borne fruit for that one, which uh, shows you that you, you can't get enough of like the the action-packed ones, put it that way. But yeah, it was great to hear over 10,000 in no time, really. And uh, so with that... In terms of divination, what is this week's tarot card, please, Sarah? This one's tarot is the Nine of Cups. And the card shows a man sitting down with his arms folded, surrounded by nine cups elegantly displayed behind him on a blue, cu- on a blue cloth. And the cups represent his trophies and past achievements. And he takes pride in showing them off. However, this man is not boastful or greedy, but he's rather generous and willing to share his wealth with others. He's the type of person who wouldn't flaunt his possessions, but he'd instead invite others to enjoy them with him. And the man is seated on a low bench, which symbolises that he doesn't consider himself superior to anyone else, despite his abundance. And he recognises that his wealth does not define his worth as a person. Now he's wearing a red hat and red socks and that represents his passion, vitality and fun loving nature and that's very similar to the fire in the belly that was mentioned during the psychic hygiene where having a passion for something is essential for one's well-being. And the Nine of Cups is a card that signifies prosperity and generosity. It's a very very lucky card. And in the Tree of Life, the card is represented by the sphere Yesod which means foundation. And the man in the card has a solid foundation and he's very grounded with both feet firmly on the ground. And he maintains a balance between the logic and intuition and he uses both of these in harmony. And the nine of cups are made up of three threes, representing the trinity of mind, body and spirit. And it represents a perfect balance between the three as- these three aspects of our being and when the card is pulled it indicates that now is the right time to commit to a goal and enjoy um, healthy relationships with people everything's in alignment and it's the perfect time to savor happiness and appreciate the present moment now as well as being a display for his trophies the table behind the man could also be set for a fine feast or for guests who were to who are yet to arrive and this ties into the man's desire to share his abundance with others now he's sitting on the wooden bench and that's not a very comfortable place to sit and that's symbolic of the fleeting nature of precious moments and how we should cherish them while they last and to finish the nine of cups is symbolic of a peak in one's life a time of prosperity and abundance and it just reminds us to enjoy the good times and to share the happiness and the wealth and to cherish these moments while they last, knowing that life is a series of peaks and valleys. It's a beautiful card. I've always had a great love for it. I love the imagery. I love the geometry of the way the card of the shows the cups around behind him. It's also, it's not the ten of cups, so there's one left to go, which shows that he's not at the end of his journey. He still has one more thing to do. And uh, it's it's a wonderful it's a wonderful card for a man to get, and uh, or for for someone a male a male that you trust or something like that it's usually a very good thing. So yeah, nine of cups is a great card. I've also pulled the nine of cups out here from the tarot uh, tarot pack that I reviewed the other week, and I like the, how on the rider weight card he's got the cards lined up on the on the table behind him and that could be in anticipation of guests arriving to share the food and the wealth and the love but in this card it's actually you've got the cups on the table with a there's a banquet there so it's quite obvious that these people in this card are more than happy to share the bounty and the food with good friends and good company so it's all about 
not being peevish and about sharing, just just sharing what you have with others and sharing the good times. Good night, everybody. Good night and see you on the first Sunday of next month.